Welcome to the Women's Connection. I'm Barry Louise Switzen, your moderator. The Women's Connection is a program about event shaping women's lives and helping one gain authentic power, both on a personal and professional level. In order to be at our maximum, we have to eat properly. My grandmother, well into her 90s, used to say, you are what you eat. Our guest today is going to address proper eating habits by the ingredients we use in incorporating the Chinese method of balancing yin and yang. And I would like to welcome Nina Simmons. Nina, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Now, in the 1970s, instead of going to France to study cuisine, you went to Taiwan. What made you decide to go to Taiwan instead? Well, originally, actually, I had intended to go to France and study French cooking. Um, I knew French, but I had also taken Mandarin in high school, and I was very interested in learning about food language and culture. I'd written, actually, to Julia Child, who had suggested, um, I asked her if there was cooking school in Paris where I could go and study, and she was very kind and wrote me, me back and said that really at that point, and this was in the early 70s, that uh, I should maybe go to Switzerland. And I really wasn't interested in going to Switzerland. But I, as I said, I had taken Mandarin in high school. I was in the first year of college and I was studying some Mandarin and I really wanted to combine food language and culture. And so I decided that I was going to go to Taiwan at that point. It was really the ideal place to go and study. Sounds exciting. And I did. Now, what is the difference between the Asian approach to food versus the Western approach? Well, I think in Asia, food is not just sustenance. There's a huge connection with language, culture, history, and particularly with, with in regards to this recent book that I've written in Food is Medicine, food plays a very important role in balance and in helping people to sort of maintain optimum health. Okay, well, before we get back to that, you then went to France. That's right. And studied. Now, did you see a lot of similarities or um, differences between French cooking, Western, and Asian cooking? Oh, well, I, what happened was I went to Taiwan. I spent four years there studying language, working with master chefs, and then it's true. I went to Paris for a year. I was a chef's apprentice at a cooking school, received a grand diplôme in um, classic French cuisine. Yes, I saw a lot of similarities between um, the French, I think, their um, passion with food is similar to the Asian or Chinese passion with food. And there's huge, I would say, parallels between the importance that it plays in the culture. And now, of course, with, with diet, I think we are finding similarities as well between the French paradox and the Asian food as medicine. And the Americans have got to catch up, or the Western world. Well, the interesting thing is, I think that um, Americans and their interest in health has had an impact on Asia, which is very interesting. I think that Asians used to be very, in, it just in, implicit in their culture is their diet is sort of more vegetables, more fruits, more seafood, but as they become more prosperous and as the, the West started influencing to them towards fast food, but I think now in some areas we're seeing a reinterest in health, and that's coming from the West. So it's pretty fascinating. We, we've come full circle. Well, I hear more about uh, Asian cooking. I mean, we all love Chinese cooking, but we still love, a I still love Asian cooking. Now, you wrote a fabulous book that's absolutely incredible. It's <laughs> called A Spoonful of Ginger, right. which is what we're going to talk about. And in it, you talk about the yin and the yang of foods. Now, what, how do you know what is a yin and what is a yang? Well, I think, first of all, it's important. Everybody knows about this concept, yin and yang. It's the two opposing forces of the universe. And what people don't realize, perhaps, is this concept applies to everything in philosophy, things. And so, like many things, for instance, women are yin and men are yang. 
And similarly, food. Foods are, are classified into three different categories. They're either yin, which means they have a cooling effect on the body. They're yang, which means they have a warming effect on the body, or they're neutral. And so uh, when I was r studying this and researching this topic, I, I studied with my Chinese doctor and I asked him, how do you remember the foods? What is yin and what is yang? It's difficult. I was going to answer that question. And, um, how do you? Because, well, let me just say that vegetables, root vegetables, are yin. Um, however, there are some vegetables that are yang, spices are yang, hot spices, fattening things. Chicken and meats are yang, seafood is yin. <laughs> the bottom line, my Chinese doctor said, is yes. what is the effect that it has on the body? And he was talking about, I guess, what does it, what does it make you do? Does it make you feel hot or cold? And also on your regularity, basically, does it constipate <laughs> you or otherwise? <laughs> and so that's one way that they tell the effect that it has on the body. But um, where it all concerns people and health is that traditional Chinese medicine says that there, when there is an imbalance, when the body is out of balance, then disease occurs. And so Chinese doctors view the body as a whole. That's why it's called the holistic approach to health. So. Chinese doctors and Asian doctors in general believe that disease will occur if your body is imbalanced. And it, you can balance your body with food. In other words, if it's cold outside, it's yin. So you eat yang foods. If it's hot outside, it's yang. So we, we eat yin foods. And when you think about it, our body is almost on a natural harmony with the seasons. When it's cold outside, we eat stews and meats and hearty soups. Those are yang dishes. When it's, so, when it's hot outside, we eat yin dishes. Those are greens and salads. So we are in many ways in natural harmony. I think if we listen to our body, and sometimes it tells us what it needs. Well, what about fall and spring? Fall and spring, well, those are getting into fall is a season which is becoming cool. It's sort of a transitional time. So it's where you're going from the summer and e eating yin foods into eating actually yang food. So that's why we eat a lot of sort of the zucchini and the squash going into the root vegetables. Um, with spring, spring is a very transitional time. It's a time of cleansing. where We go from very heavy foods, we start lightening our diet a little bit. Okay, because it's almost like it you could follow the seasons on what is being produced to yes, know what to be eating. Absolutely. But here in New York, yes, well, I you mean, can get everything. everything Twenty-four. What do you do? Twenty-four hours. Yeah. I mean, three hundred and sixty-five days. Well, I think ideally, it's really good to listen to the natural harmony and to use what's available. I mean, we say, really, it's best to take advantage of what's grown in your area locally. Of course, being in New York in <laughs> the winter, hard. it is hard, but I think that you can do that if we get ourselves back on more of a harmonious existence with the seasons, it's, it's worthwhile. On the other hand, there are, there is a lot to be said for the wonderful phytonutrients in all in kinds of foods. Wait a minute, what are phyto what are phyto phytonutrients? Phytonutrients are the health-giving properties in foods. For instance, tomatoes contain a phytonutrient called lycopene. It's gotten a lot of press lately. That's what gives you the red pigment in the, the tomato. And they believe that is what now their understanding w may prevent prostate cancer. Another phytonutrient, tofu and soybeans, there's a lot of talk about that, how that can prevent menopausal symptoms and perimenopause, PMS. Phytoestrogen in tofu and soybeans is a type of phytonutrient. Well, that's good because I eat a lot of tofu, but it's then great. 
On the other hand, which is very interesting, I can't eat tomatoes because oh. of the acid in them. I can't eat red ones, but I can eat yellow ones. So there you go. You can, um, but sometimes if you mix foods, it will have a more balanced effect on your body. How do you know what to mix? Well, it, it's uh, interesting. I mean, there are certain things that you can learn, but I, th I think that when with different cuisines, for instance, one of the, in this book, Spoonful of um, Ginger, I really went all over the world and interviewed authorities, Asian holistic authorities on food as medicine. There's a fascinating man, he's an American, believe it or not, who's lived in Asia for 20 some years, but he's come, become an expert on traditional Chinese medicine. And he believes that classic Chinese cuisine originated from um, traditional Chinese medicine and the reason that you pair. For instance, in many dishes, you cook meat with ginger and with garlic and with dis different seasonings. Ginger and garlic helps you to digest food better. And so that was done for a purpose. Similarly, with seafood, we marinate. Asian chefs marinate seafood, which is generally yin, with rice wine and ginger, which are yang seasonings. So a balance is created. So if you look at some of the classic cuisines and you go way back to the origins, sometimes these mixtures were created for the effect of balance. Wow, <laughs> I gotta s study this. I know reading your book was an educational experience because with the recipes you were talking about the ingredients and the uh, s not the side effects but right. the side benefits yes. that you get from yes. the different ingredients. And you also go into explaining like you have 10 recipes in there for sexuality, 10 yeah. for cold and flu, 10 for, um, what was the oh other yeah. one? It was promoting sexuality, <laughs> right. cold and flu. PMS and PMS, the effects right. of perimenopause. Right. Okay. Talk about that a little bit, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> um, well, I think, first of all, I, I think it's very important to say that this is a cookbook. And to me, food has to taste delicious. So I want people to understand that these, there are over 200 recipes in the book that were developed to, to be delicious recipes, but they were developed keeping in mind that many of these recipes can help you to prevent disease and to help you maintain good health. So for instance, um, people say, how can I incorporate this into, their, into my life? For instance, if I feel a cold coming on, if I want to prevent a cold, right. I immediately make a soup, a chicken soup <laughs> with miso, with lots of tofu miso. and shiitake mushrooms. Shiitake mushrooms bolster the immune system. It's almost like taking the herb echinacea. And so when I feel that I have a cold or flu or, or some other type of disease coming on, I immediately start cooking with shiitake mushrooms. Ginger and garlic kill bacteria. Oh, good Similarly, smell. similarly, they, they, they aid digestion, so, and they also promote sexuality, actually, <laughs> so, if I'm feeling a cold coming on, if I'm feeling not particularly sexual, my husband is complaining, I always have a headache, then I start preparing some of these dishes. Well, that's an interesting combination, garlic yes. and ginger, because, my God, your breath is enough to kill you. <laughs> I mean, ward well, off, you know. Everybody has to eat those foods, so there, were, there won't be any disparity <laughs> with, the, with the breath. But no, there are different foods. Talk about PMS. Um, we now know that tofu and soybeans are foods that help prevent some of the um, negative symptoms of PMS and perimenopause and menopause because those foods, soybeans, be contain phytoestrogen, mm -hmm. which is a plant-like type of estrogen. So it helps the body to create, sort of to, to um, maintain a balance rather than have this imbalance. But also there have been studies recent, recently 
we're cruciferous vegetables like cabbage okay. and all types of cabbage and broccoli and Brussels sprouts also have phytoestrogens. So those too can help to prevent PMS, perimenopause, negative symptoms of perimenopause and menopause. So are these foods that we're eating that we can make delicious coleslaw, br um, Brussels sprouts, that are really also having other effects on the body. So it's pretty fascinating. God, that's so, uh, it's like you really have to study your nutrition and recipes at the same time to well, really get balanced. You know, but it really isn't because when I started researching this book, and it was over 20 years ago, the, my, the main source of my uh, research were women, were grandmothers, who, were, who had these recipes that they were passing down from generation to generation of foods that they were cook at particular times of month. If a woman was having a baby, there were certain foods that they would prepare. If a woman was approaching, you know, PMS, there were certain foods that they would prepare, carbohydrates or whatever. And then it's really only in the past five years that um, doctors, have, that I've been able to talk to doctors about the phytonutrients, and even in Asia, I went to the Shanghai College of Traditional Medicine. And so there, there are a few things that are helpful in knowing, but there are a, f a few foods that we're learning are really good for ma maintaining optimum health. Well, that's good to know because, yeah. you know, you, I, I'm a chocoholic and I don't deny this. And you get these cravings every now and then. It's like I need a sugar fix. And well, it's really know, difficult. Well, you know, there are some theories that you cr chocolate does create serotonin, which gives you that feel good effect. But there are theories that um, there, there are people who are doing research on why Americans are so, they crave sweets. And I think. Um, there, there are some people who are doing research and some people are saying that our diet is not completely balanced. And, and so uh. if it was a little bit more balanced, another thing is I believe that you shouldn't deprive yourself, that this whole thing with maintaining good health and preventing disease is all about balance. So people say to me, what it, should I have a dessert? What if I feel like a dessert? And I say, have that dessert. And then to, for the next two days, eat really healthfully. And so it's all about maintaining balance, really. Well, well let's go back to your spoonful of ginger cookbook yeah. a second. You mentioned you use a lot of soy sauce. Yes. Okay, I have problems. Or soy products. Soy products, right. sorry. Well, you have problems with the, soy sauce. I have a big problem salt. with the salt. Yeah issue because it seems to stay in my system too long and I keep bloating up right. and it makes you uncomfortable. Right. Can you substitute anything for that? Well, yes. What well, The best thing, if you are on a low sodium, there are of course low sodium soy sauces, but the best thing that you can do yeah. is to bring up the other seasonings, to bring uh. up the ginger, to bring up the garlic, to bring up, um, for instance, I use lemongrass. I use all kinds of other seasonings and cilantro and fresh herbs. You want to bring up those seasonings, and then you probably won't even notice that you aren't using quite as much salt. Well, that's good because I tried to cook with no salt. That's one reason yeah, I gave I, up so, uh, soups is because yeah. they always use so much sodium or of one uh, um, type or another, and it just doesn't agree with my system. And I think, you know, actually, when I was in France, I cooked for a French actor who was on a no sodium diet. And I found that if I really brought up the herbs and the seasonings, uh -huh. it made a difference. And there's, um, you can buy these vegetable stock, non-salted vegetable stock bases and almost use them a little bit like a condiment. They add quite a bit of fa flavor. But I think if you use uh, beautiful ingredients and f lots of fresh herbs and seasonings, then it really does help you to not notice that you're using quite as much salt. Oh, can you s substitute anything for sugar? 
as you use in your cakes and your desserts. And right. Stuff. Well, actually, you know, one of the things that I think that, yes, you, I mean, you can use honey, you can use brown sugar, mm -hmm. maltose. And what's, excuse me, what's maltose? Maltose is a type of, it's, it's a better type of sugar. Um, Asian cooks believe that sugar is, in, in fact, used within um, balance. It's not a negative thing. It's good to have a little bit of sugar in your diet. But I do, in my book, have a lot of sort of fruit-based desserts that are very fresh and light and refreshing. And I think that's yes. very helpful when you're trying to not have, uh, but see, I also have some incredibly sumptuous, wonderful desserts, which use, I have a recipe for madeleine, which are those wonderful little um, sponge cakes, which you dip in tea. And I use lots of um, fresh orange peel. And I really cut back on the butter and I serve it with green tea which we've discovered is another food which prevents, is, is really good for your health. It bolsters the immune system. They're learning it, it prevents cancer, certain types of cancer. So I say, have some things and drink lots of tea. <laughs> the green tea <laughs> right, especially. green tea. <laughs> How long does it take to prepare your recipes on the average? Well, I'm a working mother, so I'm really, I, the, the, many of the recipes vary, but there's an incredible, there are over 200 recipes, and I'm very mindful of convenience in time, and so I really tried to develop recipes where the ingredients were available in well-stocked supermarkets. You don't necessarily have to go to an Asian market to get the ingredients, so I would say, Many of them can be done between 20 and 25 minutes. There are some that take longer to, to prepare. But I really do believe that um, people are, I mean, I'm mindful of time and convenience as much as the next person because I, like many other people, have a life besides just <laughs> making food. So um, I try to develop a number of recipes that were easy but also um, convenient and, and user friendly. Well, let me ask you something. You can you uh, make them today and serve them tomorrow, uh, or can you freeze them? Are they do they have a absolutely? And I do. There are head notes. There are tips. There are um, I, many of the recipes can be prepared in advance or. People ask me with a stir-fried recipe, there seems to be a lot of preparation. How do I get around that? First of all, I use um, I use equipment like the food processor to help chop oh, things. Oh, good. Absolutely. And I also chop small quantities of things and store it. But usually, very often, what I do is prep everything, get it all ready, and then put it away. And then just before I'm ready to serve, I just put things together very, very quickly. But there are some steam foods, there are some soups, there are stews. There are many things that taste even better when they're reheated. Oh, that's good to know, because yeah. uh, I'll cook on a Sunday and Absolutely. cook for like a week and then don't I have to worry about it when you come home and I it's do, just like pop it in. I do exactly the same <laughs> thing, actually. But you find, you know, when I first came back from Asia, I was very young and I used to prepare these multi-course banquets for my boyfriend and husbands and friends. And then, I mean, as I got a life, I had a, a child and, you know, I, I've become very sensitive to making de meals in the time it can take. So I too like to have dishes that don't take a lot of time to prepare. Now, I just want to ask you, is there any particular recipes or recipes in a spoonful of ginger that you really enjoy preparing that you say is like, the ultimate. I know they're all good. Yeah, I know. And it's really kind of hard. Someone's asking you, like, choosing between your children. <laughs> Which one is your favorite? Um, I'm sorry. But yeah, no, so but cute. there are, no, absolutely. Um, there are some favorites that I have. There's a wonderful recipe for um, people like in uh, rain, easy dishes, you ask. Right. Um, this is, I have a number of meal in one noodles. There's a recipe for rainbow peanut noodles. That's vegetables with a spicy peanut sauce. Similarly, there's a recipe for noodles with a sesame sauce, which is along the wow, same lines. Good. I have some steamed 
Um, there's a steamed ginger shrimp, which is really simple. I have a stir-fried chicken with basil, which is really simple but lovely. There's a steamed banana cake, which I'm particularly <laughs> fond of, right. which is very light, and bananas promote sexuality. So, But this is a cake that, that can be prepared ahead and steamed, and then you can just reheat it. Um, let's see, other dishes that I like, there are some wonderful finger foods that I, uh, there are little dumplings that can be made ahead, frozen and then just reheated. Um, there are some really lovely Malaysian, I mean, it, it's an Asian book, so, but there are also East, West, I love to grill, so there are wonderful grilled seafood dishes that are really nice to cook. So it's I'm sort getting of hungry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but there were some wonderful vegetable dishes, and for vegetarians, there's a whole chapter devoted to vegetarian dishes. So I really tried to. I spent a, a, about seven years writing this book. In I can see it. It's <laughs> fabulous. In the closing moments of the show, what would you like to leave the audience with? Well, I think that what's exciting is that we can help prevent disease and we can create dishes that are delicious and help us to prevent and sometimes cure disease. So it's very empowering and I think that is one of the most important things. We're all getting a little bit older and we want to stay in good health. So I think it's important to prepare foods that we enjoy but will help us to prevent disease and to stay in good health. Wow. Sounds exciting. And Nina, I want to thank you so thank much you for joining so much. me. This has been wonderful. My pleasure. And thank you also for joining us. If you would like a list of the 10 recipes that will promote sexuality, prevent flu and colds, or PMS and the ill effects of perimenopause, do write me, Barry Switzen at The Woman's Connection. Look forward to hearing from you. Bye now. <laughs>